It is a pleasure to welcome you together with Fernando Ristoy, Chairman of the Financial Stability Institute at the BIS, to this high-level event to commemorate the 10 years of existence of the FSB resolution standard, the key attributes of effective resolution regimes. Fernando and I are delighted that it was possible to bring together, even if only virtually, all past and present chairs of the FSB Resolution Steering Group. Sir Paul Tucker, Elke Koenig, Mark Branson, and Yelena McWilliams. As secretary to the FSB Resolution Steering Group, I have had the privilege of working closely with them all, and I can attest to the important role that they played together with Swan Andresen, the FSB's former secretary general, in putting together a framework that is both intellectually and politically robust and that addresses one of the greatest challenges that face the international regulatory community. The history of the key attributes didn't start with the resolution steering group. Attempts to tackle the too big, too complex, too interconnected, too failed problem go back decades to initiatives by the FSB's predecessor, the Financial Stability Forum, the Basel Committee and the G10, but none of them succeeded. In the early days of the FSB in 2009, Paul Tucker, who then uh, chaired the FSB's working group on crisis management, took the initiative to establish what we called at the time the Hearts and Mind Group, a small group of senior officials who shared keen interest in tackling too big to fail once and for all. In the following year, at their summit in Toronto in June 2010, the G20 leaders called on the FSB to develop concrete policy recommendations to effectively resolve systemically important financial institutions and to do so by the time of the Seoul summit in November 2011. The G20 leaders specifically asked the FSB to include bail-in options. So, Essentially, the G20 leaders gave the FSB a little more than a year to come up with a new standard to solve a problem that had remained unresolved for decades and to develop what was essentially an entirely new resolution tool, bail-in. The deliberations of the Hearts and Mind Group led the FSB to ask Paul to establish a broader uh, senior level group, the Resolution Steering Group, and to mandate that group to oversee the formulation of high-level principles on the attributes of effective resolution regimes. This first task of the Resolution Steering Group with Sir Paul as its chair was completed in record time. The group was established in June 2010. A year later, in July 2011, it published a consultative document. And just three months Later, in October 2011, the key attributes were finalized and adopted by the FSB plenary, and then in November, endorsed by the G20 leaders as the international standard for resolution. I think you will agree that this can be rightly considered a remarkable accomplishment of the international community. The Financial Stability Board proved to be just the right forum to achieve something that had eluded its predecessors. It is therefore an enormous pleasure that the FSB Chair, Klaus Notch, President of the Netherlands Bank, will address the audience before we turn to a discussion with the rest of the chairs that Fernando will moderate. Klaus took office just a week ago, but he is not at all a newcomer to the work of the FSB. He had been involved in its work in his previous incarnations. Importantly, he participated in his capacity as Deputy Treasurer General at the Dutch Finance Ministry in the FSB's earliest deliberations on the policy framework for systemically important financial institutions. With that, let me turn over to our chair, Klaus Nott. It is my honor uh, to uh, the, deliver something which is a sort of first uh, address that I give uh, in my new capacity as incoming FSB chair. You've seen that the banner has arrived in Amsterdam. The uh, communication challenges have been overcome, so we're ready to go. Um, it's also quite timing, actually, to have this address here, because last month marked exactly 10 years since the, since the key attributes of effective resolution regimes for financial institutions were endorsed by G20 leaders in Cannes as an international standard. 
and developed in the aftermath of the 2008 global financial crisis as part of what I would say was a sweeping reform agenda, the key attributes were designed to tackle the problem of too big to fail financial institutions. One of the lessons of the global financial crisis was the need to establish effective resolution regimes. And this was necessary to ensure that the cost of a failure in a syst systemic financial institution would no longer be borne by taxpayers. The key attributes aim to achieve this goal, that is, if a firm fails, it can be resolved without severe disruption to the financial system and without exposing taxpayers to losses. To this end, the key attributes set out a range of tools aimed at providing authorities with sufficient powers and control over the resolution of financial institutions. And they ensure a consistent approach to the design of resolution regimes across jurisdictions and facilitate cross-border coordination in a crisis. The key attributes were developed to be the gold standard resolution framework. They've been the backbone of cross-border coordination for crisis management and resolution. They've helped guide many countries around the world in establishing national resolution regimes in a way that is consistent across jurisdictions, but takes account of country-specific details. The FSB has been greatly assisted in doing this by the collaboration of the IMF and the World Bank on assessment methodologies. And as a result of the key attributes, a whole resolution infrastructure has developed over the past 10 years. This goes for the banking sector as well as for insurers and CCPs, albeit at a less advanced level in most jurisdictions. Today, in many countries, designated resolution authorities are in place that possess the necessary legal powers and operational capacity to intervene in and resolve financial institutions that are no longer viable. For internationally active firms, crisis management groups underpinned by cross-border cooperation agreements have been established. Global, systemically important financial institutions, or the so-called GCIFIs, <laughs> have established recovery and resolution plans. They have worked on removing barriers to resolvability. And resolvability assessments are being conducted to evaluate the credibility and feasibility of resolution strategies. But 10 years on, can we really claim success? While the key attributes have been instrumental in addressing the too big to fail problem, the orderly resolution of a troubled GCV has not yet been tested. And new challenges may arise either from the organic evolution of a firm's business or from external influences. So let me park the question about success just for a moment and let us instead recall why the resolution reforms are so important. Prior to the key attributes, authorities had to rely on general bankruptcy laws and insolvency liquidation that was completely unsuitable for financial institutions particularly for those institutions that provide critical economic functions that need to be maintained. These weaknesses in dealing with insolvent financial institutions became very clear during the global financial crisis. In October 2008, I participated as a senior aide to the previous governor in the crisis management meetings in Brussels to prevent the imminent collapse of Fortis, the former Belgian-Dutch financial conglomerate. In retrospect, the issues we encountered during those days tick almost every box of the key attributes. But the key attributes did not exist at that time, so we had to improvise. For example, the authorities did not have the legal instruments to impose losses on shareholders while keeping the conglomerate running. The existing framework for information sharing and policy coordination between the home and the host supervisors was flawed, to put it mildly. And there was no pre-arranged plan for funding in the case of resolution. I remember that once the agreement was struck about nationalization of the Dutch parts of Fortis, the Dutch state treasury had to go to the market overnight for 50 billion euros. A large part of this was needed to secure funding for Fortis Bank Netherlands. 
50 billion. That was almost one-fifth of our pre-crisis national debt that had to be funded largely overnight. And I could go on and on. It could easily have become our European Lehman moment. After the global financial crisis, there was widespread agreement that we needed new instruments to be able to let financial institutions fail in an orderly manner. But how to do it? Making banks and insurers resolvable was an idea that, to most countries, was completely new. How could we operationalize an idea that could work across widely different countries? An idea that until then had only existed in people's heads. And this is what has made the key attributes groundbreaking. They not only answered the questions, what does an effective resolution regime look like? And what are its key building blocks? They also provided the building instructions, starting from the end goal and then working backwards. Concrete enough to get to work and high level enough so that it would be applicable in a widely different jurisdiction. In that way, it made the translation from the drawing board to actual practice. And that was an extraordinary achievement. But perhaps the most important change the key attributes have brought about is that apart from setting a standard for resolution regimes, they also introduced a planning requirement. As US President Eisenhower once famously said, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. And this is true for all forms of crisis management. Resolution planning for systemic financial firms has been instrumental in identifying and addressing a multitude of legal and operational issues that could form an obstacle to orderly resolution. And this has also greatly improved capabilities at firms and other stakeholders to support resolution. Making financial firms resolvable is a long process. The FSB's Too Big to Fail evaluation that was completed earlier this year showed that implementation is very advanced in jurisdictions that are home to banks designated as globally systemically important, more commonly known as GSIPs. But implementation could still be improved in jurisdictions that are not home to GSIPs. After all, other banks can also be systemic, nationally or cross-border. And while authorities and firms may now on paper be better prepared for a crisis, this also needs to be tested through dry runs and other means to gain assurance. And external stakeholders may need to also play their part if a firm were to be resolved. So practical and operational cooperation and communication deserve specific attention as part of this. I guess the job will never be completely finished and perhaps it's not meant to be. Resolution planning is an ongoing process that has become an indispensable complement to going concern prudential supervision. Indeed, the FSB's resolution report, published today, flags digital innovation as an emerging challenge that will need to be addressed in resolution planning. But, returning to my earlier question, in light of the very significant progress made and conscious of the work still to be done, I think it is altogether fitting that we celebrate this 10-year anniversary as a success. We have come a long way. And that, of course, raises the question, a question that is also particularly dear to my mind, what broader lessons does the story of key attributes teach us? How can we use these lessons from the past to meet the financial stability challenge that we face today? In my view, the success of the key attributes was due to three things. First, a strong political commitment across nations to take action on too big to fail as a problem that requires a global solution. Second, bringing the key decision and policy makers together to develop an analytically sound and hands-on approach. And third, keeping track of implementation progress across jurisdictions along the way and exerting peer pressure to ensure progress on a global scale. The Financial Stability Board, as set up by the G20 leaders to develop and implement the post-2008 crisis reforms, 
was the perfect organization to perform that role. Its global and cross-sectoral membership of central banks, finance ministries, bank supervisors, market regulators, international organizations, it brings together the key policymakers on global financial stability. It provides a unique forum to forge consensus. It operates with active involvement of senior level officials in a collegial spirit of mutual trust. The FSB, through the G20 process, also provides for a strong link to political decision makers, including the heads of state. The FSB has played a vital role in bringing domestic and foreign regulators together to build the capacity, trust and communication necessary to make effective resolution of systemic financial institutions possible. In that sense, Tim Geithner was right when he said that the FSB is the fourth pillar of the global architecture of cooperation, alongside the IMF, the World Bank and the WTO. I am convinced these three ingredients of success can also guide us in dealing with the new challenges to global financial stability that we face today. Indeed, most new challenges facing the global financial system cut across sectors and jurisdictions and cannot easily be classified in the typical bank insurance or securities buckets. This has been evident in our work to address climate-related financial risks, where our roadmap aims to support a consistent approach among authorities in the coming years. It is also evident in our roadmap to enhance cross-border payments. Here we are working with the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures and other relevant international organizations and standard-setting bodies to address the challenges which affect cross-border payments. And finally, on crypto assets and global stable coins, the FSB has developed 10 high-level recommendations that promote coordinated and effective regulation, supervision and oversight of global stablecoin arrangements to address the financial stability risks both by them, both at the domestic and international level. These challenges have one thing in common. They are global in nature. And therefore, they also require solutions that are globally adopted and globally consistent. Yet, in order to be effective, these global solutions have to take account of country-specific details when it comes to implementation. These are big challenges, but compared to 10 years ago, we have one big advantage. We can rely on a framework of international cooperation that has been tested and proven to work. For over a decade, the Financial Stability Board has promoted and coordinated important financial reforms, and it will continue to do so in the future. So let us continue our work in this spirit of international cooperation and operational excellence that made the key attributes the success it is today. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Klaus, for your remarks. Uh, let me now give the baton to Fernando Restoy, Chairman of the Financial Stability Institute here at the BIS in Basel, who will moderate the panel discussion. Many thanks, um, Eva. It's a pleasure, obviously, to partner with the FSB in organizing this, this event. Oh, and of course, thank you very much, President Nott, uh, Klaus, for your great insightful keynote, uh, keynote address. So let's now turn to this panel session. The, the purpose is basically to, to take a stock of everything which has been achieved over the last uh, 10 years since the adoption of the FSB key attributes in, in October 2011. But also, of course, and very importantly, to, to consider what more uh, needs to be, to be done to, to achieve the, the objectives of those key attributes, namely, as has been stressed by by class note uh, to, uh, to make sure that any potentially systemic firm can uh, fail safely without the assumption of large public support and loss to taxpayers. So as Eva has made clear, uh, the, the key activities were a significant uh, milestone. They, they, they grew from the lessons of the financial crisis that a special, some would say extraordinary powers are required to manage the risks that banks and other systemic financial institutions uh, pose when they fail. 
the key attributes uh, formalize the powers and, and arrangements needed to manage such failures in an international standard with accompanying sectoral guidance to uh, basically to, to apply actually those uh, those those key attributes to the specific features of insurers, uh, CCPs, and other market infrastructures. The implementation, implementation of the key attributes uh, has transformed the toolkits of many authorities globally and created a new institutional infra infrastructure of solution authorities, crisis management groups, and other fora for cross-border uh, cooperation. But of course, the 18 pages of the, of the core standard was just uh, the beginning. Um, in the last decade, a huge amount of collaborative work has been carried out within the FSB and the wider international community to produce credible resolution strategy, improve firms' uh, resolvability, and also to ensure that resolution plans are fully operational. The, the magnitude of this task uh, and the unfinished uh, business is actually reflected in the titles of the FSB's annual resolution progress reports. For instance, in 2018, the report was titled Keeping the Pressure Up. In 2019, the title uh, chosen at the time was Mind the Gap. In 2020, the title was Be Prepared, and this year, the report, which is now being be published, is titled Glass Half Full or Still Half Empty. So you have heard uh, the FSB Resolution Steering Group has been at the heart of, of, of this work. So we are extremely delighted to have with us today the, uh, all the former and the current chair of the Resolution Steering Group. They are all very familiar faces to, to, to all of us, so we don't need actually to spend much time in introducing them. I will just follow the chronological order of their time as, as RSG chairs. So first, Paul Tucker. Uh, Paul Tucker was chair uh, of the of RSG from its creation in January 2011 until the end of October 2013. So he was in the driving seat when the key attributes were were developed, drafted, and, and adopted. He also oversaw the, the guidance on resolution strategy, studies that crystallized uh, the core concept of single point of, on, single point of entry and multiple point of entry resolution strategies. Sir Paul is currently, as you know, a, a research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. Elke Koenig succeeded Paul from November 2013 to November 2013. 17. During this, this period, the FSB adopted, among other things, the TILAC standard and also guiding principles on internal TILAC. LK is uh, currently the chair of the European Single Resolution Board. Mark Branson took over the reins from LK in 2017 and chaired the resolution steering group until the end of October uh, this year. So in this period, the RESI's output included important guidance on bailing execution and also funding strategies in resolution planning. For most of that period, uh, uh, Mark was the CEO of the Swiss Integrated Supervisor, uh, FINMA, and is now president of the, of the German um, uh, Integrated Supervisor, uh, Buffy. And also we are very fortunate to have with us uh, the current chair of RESG, uh, Jelena McWilliams. As you all know, she is the chair of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation in the, in the U.S. I'm pretty much looking forward to Jelena's work. Probably she will take advantage of the participation in this, in, this, uh, in this meeting to share with us her views about the main priorities of the FSB in relation to resolution work in the, in the coming, in the coming uh, months and years. So thank you all very much for joining us today. We have agreed with the, with the speakers, with the panelists, that we are going to structure this panel into three different sessions. We will, we will start talking about the past. We'll start about you know, discussing about the, the main achievements, the main challenges uh, to date. Then we'll immediately move to the more forward-looking part of our session. So we want to discuss the, 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 the work that still needs to be, to be done. And the third round will be an open Q&A session. So we'd like to invite all participants in this, uh, in this uh, seminar to, uh, to participate, to convey to us their views, their comments, their questions. Uh, they can use that uh, by means of the chat function that you can see 
in the right uh, right uh, bottom corner of your WebEx uh, screen. Um, if you want to address a question to a specific uh, panelist, please uh, just say so in the in the in the chat in the chat itself. So, without further ado, let's move to this first round of uh, intervention by our panelists. Uh, this is about essentially of the past. Let me first uh, ask uh, maybe Paul Tucker to share to share uh, his views with us about main challenges, main actually uh, achievements uh, uh, over the time where, where where he was the chair of RECI. And in particular, I want to have a, I have a specific question for 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 Paul has to do with the bailing tool, probably the most controversial, but also probably the most relevant element of the new resolution framework, you know, uh, we all know that uh, some people remain relatively skeptical about how this, this actually bailing tool, bailing powers could actually work in practice. So as we do not have yet uh, many examples of the use of this tool, this bailing tool in practice, let me ask you very directly whether you feel that if we had actually to apply the bailing tool to bail in a GSA, that will actually work. So let me start with that, Paul. So the floor is yours, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Fernando and Eva, for inviting me to be here and join people who are in office and have serious responsibilities. Um, Yes, I, I, I think that leaders would would have a, a serious choice, whereas in 2008 they had no choice between chaos and the taxpayer bailout. And my aim quite clearly in 2009 onwards was to get to a position where the President of the United States, the Chancellor of Germany, in future the leader of, of the party in China, my own Prime Minister, would have a choice. And I think they would have a choice. And actually, I think for some of the U U.S. securities dealers, I said this publicly before I left office, um, I think some of the U.S. security dealers could have been subjected to bail-in from 2012, 2013, after the Dodd-Frank Act had been passed. Um, that's, that's not to say it would be pretty. This is to do with crises. People tend to talk about crises as though they're binary. There either is a crisis or there isn't a crisis. I think, I think that's hugely misleading. Um, Crises are like Dante's circles of hell. There are there are some um, that are much worse than others. The the hell that my generation um, presided over was actually not nearly as bad as the hell of the 1930s. The hell that um, that Yelena, if she's unlucky enough to face a crisis, will preside over um, can be much better than 2008, 2009. Of that, I have absolutely no doubt um, whatsoever. H having said that, um, so in a way, I think also uh, with 10 years having passed, there's no excuse if it doesn't work. No excuse that if they've concluded it doesn't work, they should have dropped it. And if they if they conclude that it can work, then they've had ample time to be ready. And if they're not quite ready, they need to be completely brutally honest with themselves behind the scenes and get ready. And I, I would I would um, mentioned three things that I think you can't tell from outside. And that's, in a sense, my biggest point. Um, you can't quite tell what's going on in the way that one can tell what's going on in monetary policy or fiscal policy, um, even when it's bad, you can tell. Um, first of all, um, I was delighted Fernando mentioned single point of entry and multiple point of entry. You, th that isn't the staple discourse of bank analysts when they discuss banks. And it's not mentioned very often by top people um, in your in your field. Secondly, I'm not convinced. Um, I may be wrong, but I'm not at all convinced that supervisors have shifted to working um, backwards from failure. I think the the mindset of supervisors is still prophylactic rather than what will happen when I fail. Um, and I, I think that's a I think that's really interesting because it's actually massively incentive incompatible. Um, so it shows that it's a cognitive um, problem. And and thirdly, and this is why it makes it so important that um, Klaus is here, that um, Jay, Christine, Andrew Bailey, um, Kuradasan, 
they don't talk about this stuff nearly enough but if one of these big um beasts fails on their watch this will be the biggest thing that happens to them in the whole of their career and so i and i, I absolutely promise you that i watched monetary policy makers realize that the difference between monetary policy where you get to change your mind every six weeks or so um is that you can change your mind every six weeks or so whereas this is the one-off event um that may define your career and i i that they don't talk about it very much i think is a warning signal and i think worth quite a few basis points on the debt of banks um for people that are pricing this stuff um rationally i think you probably want me to say something as well about um how it all happened but let me pause there all right very good so of course we can go back to you later if you can tell us interesting stories about this um so let's now try to invite the other previous chairs of the presidency to to join this this conversation about basically discussing main achievements main challenges so let's try to to see your views of your assessment about actually what has been achieved so far what the main and the main challenge what have been found uh in the process so let me let me start with elke elke could you please yes Take the floor. Thank you very much for joining us as well. Yeah. Thank you. I hope you can hear me loud and clearly. And it's always very thought provoking to listen to Paul. So thank you for your introduction. And let me perhaps build a bit on your introduction. I think you're right. Leaders today, member states in our case, have a serious choice between resolution or whatever form of, I would say, creative insolvency or bailout they want to go for. Unfortunately, one topic is also to be realistic. Our resolution framework is there. We are still building it up. I've always used the metaphor that it's a marathon and not a sprint. So it's building up the tools. It's building up all the capabilities. But in principle, we have a toolkit and we have, thanks to the work on the key attributes, but also perhaps thanks to the TLEC term sheet, we have now a framework that really can work and can provide a solution. And I always cite something which was not invented by me. Resolution is not about resurrection. It's about re-stabilizing and then restructuring and solving step by step topics, but not to have the disruption between Friday and Monday where, and I think uh, uh, class alluded to it in his experience, but the same in my home country, where on a weekend you had the choice between an unpredictable chaos or nationalizing a bank, which probably none of them had ever thought of the days before. So I think we have now a framework. And when I look back at my time at as rest chief chair, I would definitely say the TLEC term sheet that was approved in 2015 was probably the milestone after the key attributes. Now I realize the key attributes took only one year to get there. The TLEC term sheet already took more than two years to be achieved. And since then, the time span for achieving something seems to be getting longer, which is also a reflection. The crisis is a bit further away. But I do think we have changed from a bailout or bailouts in disguise, which seem to be still popular, to a bail-in framework since then. And when you said, Paul, it's not getting pretty, then I always get the impression the problem is in a bail-in framework, which is fair because it puts the burden to those that had at least the chances beforehand, but there you know whom you are bailing in. Yeah, Unfortunately, the bailout framework is this nice way of someone has to pay the burden in the coming decades. So I think it's always a bit an intriguing there. But from my point, where do we stand? I think the TLEC term sheet is the one step, but now it needs to be really soundly implemented. It's very easy to say that you up you upstream losses or you downstream capital but in a world with legal entities in a world with different corporate law systems and the like there's a lot of 
how do you really implement it, test it, cooperate there? And I would stop here for the moment. I think uh, looking back at, at my time at the helm of, of, of uh, ResG, uh, the, um, uh, the the situation was one of, of fading memories. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, once we're uh, 10 years away from, from the event when we uh, or wished that we had had more optionality and more tools, um, you know, 10 years later, you know, people have tended to, you know, forget how that felt, and 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 uh, you know, so we are at, at, at still at this point in time, um, uh, yeah, in 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 a period where the call to action, you know, is 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 um, yeah, losing its echo uh, gradually, uh, and and obviously that's what we as policymakers have to have to try and guard against. I think when when um, you look at the 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 time that I I um, had the privilege of of leading the group, um, the policy framework was broadly uh, in place. Um, if you think about the key attributes, the TLAC term sheet, many of the policy choices uh, had been made, not all, but many of them. Um, and, and as Elke said, a lot of it is about uh, ha seeing how um, plausible the implementation uh, in, in the various jurisdictions is of, of, those, of that policy framework um, and filling in the details. Um, uh, and uh, you know, obviously, in a way, less glamorous, but just just as important. One of the other things that I think was important, um, if you think about uh, milestones, achievements. Um, I, I remember at the time of taking over uh, ResG, there was uh, the this, the question as to you know whether it wasn't. Whether, whether it wasn't already done and whether whether one needed such a a, a, a group at the top table of the FSB. Um, uh, and I remember talking with 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 Mark Carney at the time and saying, well, you know, uh, I'm I'm happy to take it over, uh, but but not if you if if you relegate this as something that's a that's already a done deal. So uh, uh, maybe forcing his hand to 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 keep uh, Res G. Um, as one of the uh, primary groupings within 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 the FSB, um, you know, was was a small achievement, I, uh, but I, I do think an important one. And I think Klaus mentioned the the importance of ResG. It's also the only group where resolution authorities around the world get together. There is no sort of international organisation of, of of resolution authorities um, uh, that is ResG. Um, uh, and, it, and it's one where the FSB has, thanks to, to, to all the work that went before, the thought leadership and the credibility um, that, that doesn't belong to another authority uh, or, or international gremium. And I think it was important to, to, and it remains important to keep this group in place. It doesn't fit into a nice box uh, uh, because it's very cross-cutting, it's cross-sectoral. Um, uh, but for that very reason, and for the reason that Paul uh, made clear, this is something which is nice to forget about, but when it rears its ugly head, it will be the most important thing that you've seen for a long time. And, and uh, you know, therefore, trying to trying to keep the memories alive, trying to keep the the work uh, going, has been one of the biggest challenges over the last um, uh, four or five years. Trying to keep the momentum, uh, trying to um, you know focus on that part of the glass that is still empty, uh, uh, rather than congratulate ourselves for that part of the glass that, that is full. Uh, um, the historians can look at the, the the progress that's been made. Our job is always to be to be a little bit paranoid about the competences we don't have, the things that aren't in place, the risks that aren't well enough covered. So, you know, as as memories still seem to be um, um, in, in a way, you know, have have other or, or the minds are full of other things than 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 what we wished we'd had uh, in in previous financial crises. Um, and, and, you know, even the turbulence we had last year uh, hasn't hasn't jogged the memories to the to the extent that maybe it should have done. If we think about sort of March 2020 uh, being another bailout event, albeit not of institutions in the regulated space, but of of uh, of, of markets in the non-bank uh, uh, space, uh, but was accompanied by a very rapid uh, crunch in liquidity in, in dollar funding markets, which could have started to trigger. Uh, contagion uh, in in a very real way. Um, you know, 
it, it passed quickly uh, because there was another type of bailout action, uh, but should have been a trigger uh, to, to, to look again at some of the aspects of the framework that are not finished. And I think we'll, we'll come on to that. You're, you're quite, you'll, you'll certainly ask us, you know, what is in this part of the glass that isn't full? Uh, and, uh, you know, there are some lessons that we could learn out of the, the, the liquidity uh, crunch in March 2020 that speak uh, exactly to that, that question. So, you know, I wish Yelena every success in trying to keep the, keep the issues alive and, and you know, uh, try and keep pressure on the industry to finish the job. Because, you know, this is, um, this is a process in many financial institutions which has been difficult and costly. It's unattractive to think about, uh, you know, not just as Paul said, you know, what, what happens when our supervised institutions fail is even less in, uh, attractive for institutions uh, themselves to think about their own failure. Uh, so it's not just unattractive, it's also costly because we ask for the compartmentalizing of resources um, and only up to a certain degree is that aligned with, with uh, how they would like to manage the institutions. So keeping the pressure on uh, to make sure that the credibility is high enough that the optionality is real. Uh, I think that that's the key. And uh, as as technical authorities, we can only provide the toolkits and give it a plausible chance of success. In the end, you know, decisions uh, will have a political element when they need to be taken. But uh, what we don't need uh, uh, is is uh, to give the powers that be the excuse to say, well, you know, no, we didn't do a bail-in because we could see that it wouldn't work because X, Y. Uh, uh, was not in place. I think that's that that would not be forgivable. Okay, many thanks, uh, Mark. Um, of course, I have seen that uh, in your interventions, uh, you have already covered what we are supposed to deal with in the second part of the of the of this uh, of this uh, session, which is about actually future. So you are already sending some messages to to Jelena McWilliams as. as as an incoming chair of the Resolution Steering Group. So again, I will actually have time to discuss that later, but in any case, I think right now it would be great, uh, Jelena, if you could share with us actually your videos about the progress that has been made so far in terms of improving the resolvability of financial institutions, improving the resolution framework all, 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 all together. So what is your take on, on this and the main achievements uh, so far in relation to this? Also, some, maybe something about the main challenges as, as well. So, Jelena, again, thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours now. Thank you, Fernando, very much. I want to give a minute maybe to Sir Paul Tucker to uh, wrap up if he, I think he was waiting for his turn. Oh, that's really kind, Jelena. Um, that's really, really kind. I, I will be very quick. I, I think if this was um, the beginnings of any kind of success, it was for four reasons. First of all, and this goes to um, something that Klaus said, um, there was an atmosphere in the resolution steering group that there would be no fudge. And actually, it would have been quite possible to put up recommendations, which were a disguised fudge, and they would have been accepted. And the group got itself to a place. Some of the really big supervisors on the group wanted to go for fudge. Unfortunately, I had known them for a quarter of a century and kind of with Svein Anderson, who I'll come on to, persuaded them of that. The second thing was conceiving of resolution as a corporate finance um, issue, that it's not the same as supervision, uh, and that whether it's purchase and assumption or bail-in, it's essentially a corporate finance thing. And that's not just a term sheet. There were two members of the um, resolution um, of the FSB steering group that repeatedly talked about term sheets as though it was a bond. But actually, it's also about restructuring groups so as to uh, so that the bonds are issued from the right place. That was the second um, big thing. And actually, I think one of my most important things I did was to leave a draft, as I called it, GLAC term sheet for the bonds in my um, outray, which I discussed with Andrew Gracie, who deserves to be mentioned. The third was um, absolutely trying to carry everybody, whether they were home supervisors or host supervisors. And that had two elements. First of all, incentive compatibility. That's that should appeal to the economists and the VIS tower. And that's, and the internal TLAC structure is hugely important to that. But the second was diplomacy. Um, everybody on the resolution group spoke a lot. And Svein Anderson and I spent six to seven hours, maybe sometimes, routinely five to six hours, the evening before every meeting, 
going through every single position that we thought would come up from other states and taking it seriously, not debating it in a sense of, well, how do we marginalize that? But why might they think that? Um, which part of that is right? Um, which part of that opens up new avenues? Which part of that, in one case, a really massive case, we, we concluded that a state had understood, misunderstood its own law. Um, Ava knows exactly what I'm referring to. This was massive. This was massive. And Svein, I think, um, who is by far the best international public servant I've ever met, was kind of crucial to ensuring that we took everybody seriously. And the final thing was trying to encode prep continuing preparation and work, but also transparency. I don't think it's worked on the transparency. And what was behind that is it beggars belief and therefore should be said taken extraordinarily seriously that during 2007 and the spring of 2000 and the summer of 2008, even after the failure of Bear Stearns, there was no preparation whatsoever for big banks failing. And if really intelligent people occupying really big offices around the world can't prepare when they've already got the biggest liquidity crisis for 70 years, you realize that somehow preparation um, needs to be real and it can't, going back to the beginning, it can't be fudged. My view then and now was that the college system between supervisors is often a systematic fudge where the people doing the fudging actually believe their own bullshit. I can use language like that. I'm not in, in office. And so that is why you have to harness the very senior people because they are the ones whose reputation will be trashed if this doesn't work. And I say this with zero pleasure, but if you, Alan Greenspan had been out of office for four or five years when this happened, and yet it trashed his reputation, even though he was no longer there. And so I've kind of always felt incentivize the, the biggest uh, the occupants of the biggest chairs, and then maybe you'll shift the incentives of the, the people lower down. And I think those were the four ingredients. And I think the people on the resolution steering group um, were a joy to chair, um, thanks to Svein's guidance, frankly, and Eva's um, behind the scenes um, diplomacy and, and substantive work. Okay, many thanks. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Fernando. And Sir Paul, your American English is excellent. Um, I will um, I will say this. It is clear to me that uh, the the all all the achievement, the significant achievement that has been accomplished in enhancing resolvability since adoption of the key attributes um, is basically um, driven in a large, large, large part by the by the three giants who chaired uh, ResG in the past. And I can only hope uh, and commit to walk in those shoes and their big shoes to fill. Um, I think one of the things that, that has become very clear throughout the last um, 10 years plus is that uh, nothing substitutes the strong working relationships internationally, uh, and they did not exist to some degree, degree a, a decade ago. They simply did not exist, and certainly not at the level at which you see them now. And I think this foundation has allowed us to make meaningful progress in cross-border resolution planning and crisis management preparedness um, and I'll give some example, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we've been working very hard, uh, and, and I attribute this to LK and Mark and, and Sir Paul, uh, to make sure that um, our working groups, um, our crisis management groups on home of home and host authorities uh, are working uh, appropriately. The firm specific uh, CMGs um, have been formed for GCIPs and for CCPs that are systemic in nature in more than one jurisdiction. Uh, we have put in place arrangements in the form of cooperation agreements to support regular engagement um, and information sharing and, and, and never underestimate the, the information sharing component of this. Again, did not exist uh, in the form in which we needed it 10 years ago. So it is really through the work of the prior RESGs and the, the FSB that we're at the place where we can actually share information and understand what's going on in each other's jurisdictions. Uh, we will continue uh, uh, cross-border working relationships on central counterparties that are systemic in more than one jurisdiction. That's, you know, when we look at the glass half full or glass half empty, that's the empty part. But I always believe that the glass is half full uh, because of the work that we have done in the past. 
Um, I will also say that the bilateral engagements among authorities have grown extensively. We, 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 the United States in particular, have good working relationship with individual jurisdictions, but now uh, it looks more like a web where there are so many connected, uh, so connecting points among uh, uh, different entities on a bilateral basis that certainly uh, leveraging those working relationships um, to build out the resolution capabilities uh, and, and being able to perform exercises uh, uh, together is going to be crucial moving forward. I will also say that uh, authorities and GSIPs have made significant progress enhancing resolability across the range of key issues, um, such as the development and implementation of total loss absorbing capacity, resolution related liquidity planning, provisions for cross border stays of early terminations, of derivatives contract in resolution, enhanced planning for maintaining access to financial market infrastructure by firms in resolution, rationalizing legal entity structures, mapping and planning related to shared services, and enhancing governance for planning and preparedness activities. Uh, we have developed um, um, a lot of uh, different resolution strategies with a single point of ent entry strategy for GSIPs becoming a prevailing strategy for many firms, and that's certainly something we did not have 10 years ago, um, even I would say even even fewer years ago. Um, not to say that the work is done by far, as Mark pointed out, uh, a lot of this work will will rest on on, um, on on how much we are able to accomplish from here. I would say that the work we have done so far uh, has been uh, has set up a really good foundation for us to build upon. But the, the, the devil is in the detail, as they like to say. Uh, in the United States, and so a lot of these things will hinge and the resolvability will hinge. On on making sure that we understand how these firms are morphing, if, to the extent that they are simplifying their structures. Exactly, how are we going to deal with the simplified structure? How are how are we going to deal deal with the more complex nature of their transactions? And in the end, uh, nothing will substitute uh, capital and liquidity and resolution, liquidity in particular, uh, and that's something that we need to continue focusing on. Um, I would say that in the United States, through the Title One resolution planning process. Uh, we have made significant strides uh, with the GSIPs. Uh, it, we implemented um, uh, structural changes and operational improvements that have enhanced their resolvability in bankruptcy. Uh, and these resolution plans have been an extremely valuable tool for improving resolvability across jurisdictions. Um, and and uh, I will say we will continue to work on those and, and make sure that the firms are able to strengthen them as they evolve and they morph. Um, and then I will say lastly um, that uh, we are going to continue working um, on a bilateral, a trilateral, multilateral basis, including through RESG, FSB, and other international bodies. Uh, there's nothing that substitutes good old relationships, and more dialogue we have about this, more understanding we'll have on how best to proceed. Um, and with that, I don't want to take too much of your time, so I will turn the floor back to you, Fernando. Okay, uh, many, many thanks. So once again, actually, it's clear that uh, when we talk about this, the past, it only provides inspiration on what, uh, what else should be doing, should be doing in, the, in, the, in the future. Uh, okay, in any case, I would like just now to give an opportunity to, to all four panelists, whether they want to ask anything in relation to challenges, challenges about achievements in, in the past before we move to the more forward-looking part of the, of the session. Any additional remark? Let me also let me also invite all participants to, to, to use the chat function to convey comments, questions um, to the speakers. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you very much for this uh, initial round of interventions. Quite interesting, stimulating. So let's now move to the second part of this of this of this panel. You uh, once you will have the opportunity to look at the resolution report, which is going to be published uh, today, later today, you will see that uh, well, the question is asked whether the glass is full, is still half half empty, or is it still half full. There, there is actually a number of uh, uh, well references to possible uh, gaps that still need to be to be filled. There are issues about uh, obviously in the case of banking about cross-border issues in particular, the location in Ternatilac, uh, for instance, when it comes to non-bank uh, financial institutions like CPs or insurance companies, the report is very outspoken about the, some uncertainties that remain 
in relation to their solvability to those type of financial institutions. So there, there are still some issues uh, on which, uh, on which obviously, uh, international community has to continue working on. And of course, the, the main question here is how? What, what can we do in order actually to fill those gaps, to be able actually to, to fill further this resolution, resolution glass? So let me now give the floor, uh, Mark, since you are actually, you were the chair of the Resolution Steering Group when this report was developed to provide us your perspective about the current situation of resolution work. I mean, just to, to tell us a little bit what is, what is missing and, and the strategy that we should try to follow in order to, to fill the, the existing gaps. And Mark, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And uh, uh, obviously, a huge amount of progress has been made to build up uh, the optionality for, for policymakers in, in future crises. And, and uh, just think about what has changed in the shape of some of the biggest banking groups that, that, that we supervise. You know, they've, they've put in place holding structures, they've ring fenced their retail banking activities, they've created service companies, they've issued uh, lots of absorbing debt in a way that didn't exist before, um, you know, for, over of of, uh, of uh, several years, so, so uh, you know we have come an, an enormously long way. And naturally, as I said earlier, um, it's more interesting to talk about uh, you know what do we still need to do uh, um, to make sure that the plausibility uh, of of the functioning of the of the, of the tools that we've uh, um, uh, prepared is as high as possible. Um, I'll just give you a, a small list of the things that I think need to be on the on the to do list of the of of, of us as international policymakers um, that aren't yet ticked off. Um, firstly, not all the resolution plans are finished, even for the GSIBs. So you know, let's be honest: not all GSIBs have a plan in place that shows they can be successfully resolved. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that, uh, but the job is the you know the basics of the job uh, uh, are not in all jurisdictions finished. Wow. Um, Secondly, I think there is uh, um, uh, there are still some nitty gritty operational challenges that are not all resolved. They can be very, you know, um, uh, they can be things that we you 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 probably might you might be fair enough to think that could get solved in a crisis because then it would have to get solved. But the nitty gritty little problems of U.S. securities law about issuing instruments and cancer policy ones, such like. So there are, there's a there's a list. That's somewhere sitting in the in the heads of the secretariat of things, you know, at a very operational level uh, in a, in bail and execution that are not not all solved. I also think that the status of planning um, and plausibility of those plans for many of the domestic uh, systemically relevant institutions is probably not where it needs to be, and some of those institutions are tricky in a different way to GSIPs because they are. Um, governed in different ways, they have different ownership structures. Uh, they have different different political profiles, which can make the the the, the decision making surrounding resolution just as tricky, uh, even if on a global scale less less dangerous. Um, I also think that uh, at some point, probably one should have a a look at the SPE concept as it has been implemented in the real world, um, because in many institutions, it probably looks a bit like a synthetic MPE concept. Uh, and I think a lot of bankers would be thinking, are thinking about that, um, you know, is, is, uh, is it working uh, the way it was promised uh, as a strategy um, or uh, you know, are they are they essentially bearing the costs of an MPE strategy um, uh, without the benefits of the multiple points of access to the market? The most one of the most important things on the banking side that is outstanding, probably the most important single thing, is is uh, uh, finishing the funding in resolution uh, work with uh, credible backstops. Um, there are many jurisdictions with important GSIBs that don't have credible credible public uh, sector liquidity backstops. Um, we are probably of the opinion that they would materialize in crisis, uh, but that's a very costly way to do it. Uh, if you have them in existence uh, in advance, then the chances of them being needed are, are much lower. Um, and then, of course, there's the big, big question, which we can't answer about, you know, is the button going to get pressed uh, when we come to the point that a, uh, that a large uh, bail-in uh, is, is called for? Um, uh, what we have is over the over the series of, of years leading up to this point, we've seen a number of medium-sized problems where every other exit route has been taken rather than that one. 
Um, and so there is a credibility deficit, um, uh, which uh, is real. Uh, when we did the too big to fail review at the FSB level, that was very clearly the view of the outside world and, and, and the academic world. There's a credibility deficit around the framework because it's never been tested and it could have been tested. Um, so that's that's uh, you know on the, especially on the banking side, um, it would be remiss of me not to mention the other sectors. Um, I think on the insurance sector we've made limited progress, but I'd also say that the 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 risks in that sector, the systemic risks, are lower than in the other two sectors, the banks where we've made the most progress and we have the most systemic risk. Um, but the other piece is the infrastructure and the CCP world where we have created uh, uh, willingly uh, and correctly more systemic risk than we had, um, uh, but we haven't really credibly answered the question as to whether we have the tools in place to deal with crisis in this very specific part of the infrastructure. So I would say there are these five, six things to do still on the banking side, which we shouldn't neglect uh, on the infrastructure side. Or we're much, uh, much earlier in the, in the definition of, of policy uh, and, and tools, uh, and, and but the systemic risk there profile has changed materially uh, from from you know wh where it was in 2007 and 8, uh, and that's a part of the glass that still needs to be pulled filled up. Okay, many thanks, uh, Mark. I think it's quite uh, interesting list of uh, to do list actually for for the future. Thank you very much for that, uh, LK, what, what is your view on this? What what remains to be done? Hmm. Well, I think, like Mark, I'm first and foremost an optimist. Otherwise, I wouldn't be where I am. And I think the glass is half full. And it's not just that we just at least have a glass. No, I think uh, Mark is perfectly right with his comments on the fact that we now really need to finish the plans for the banks to become fully resolvable. This, as I said, is a multi-year process and we need to be the ones to push the banks to really have thought uh, about this and to have these plans there will be quite some operational challenges and just to add one to what marcus said at least when i look at our environment here in europe while well, we are faced with for the banking union now 21 different legal systems to some extent, they have some commonalities, but insolvency frameworks are different, corporate law frameworks are different. So what we are really working on is to make sure that an idea like bail-in can be implemented under all different frameworks and that we can be assured. And it's needed, and Mark, I think it's been explained also before, it's very simple to say you protect the host countries by internal TLEC, but then show me how in case of a crisis are you converting TLEC into capital? How do you absorb losses in all different legal frameworks? And this is one of our key priorities for the moment, because clearly otherwise you will not overcome some kind of home host consideration and with that probably rather uh, fragmentation. I think this is work to be done. I fullheartedly agree with Mark that we also need to consider that it's good to focus on the GSIPs, but I think the first one to write about it was on the one hand you, uh, Fernando, but also Martin Greenberg about what can happen with a domestically important bank and how much chaos and how much cost can be involved. So we should cast our net a bit wider and we're coming to different topics. Funding and resolution, clearly from our side, an issue. We have a clear solution with our fund for basically recapitalization and I think therefore sizable enough. But funding, meaning liquidity in resolution, Paul, was probably the topic we left out a bit at the very beginning because we thought if we have a credible recapitalization of the bank, then funding will be provided by the market, but unfortunately not on Monday morning. So we need to have a very clear answer there. And there at least a number of countries are still missing out. And last but not least, definitely we need to go further in 
thinking about the risks that CCPs, and Mark is for perfectly correct, we created them for a very good cause, but they are also then a systemic risk can pause on, uh, can bring to their clearing members and how to deal with really the resolution of CCPs in this context. There's still a lot of work to be done. And I would take then probably insurance second, though I'm always reminded that we have some bank assurance operations where you wonder how do you deal if the failure comes from the insurance side, how interconnected are they? So a lot of work is still to be done, but probably the most important part, and I like this from Mark to say, that we keep alive the idea that a crisis can happen and it will not be a repeat of the last crisis. It will be just something different. That's the only thing which I think is for sure. Very good, Elke. Thank you very much for this wise conclusion to your remarks. Um, now, Paul, uh, on this, okay, uh, challenges for the future, what to be done? I mean, you may want to actually to respond a little bit more on the issue of non-banks, but I mean, feel free to take the angle that you please. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I, I will say um, just something very quickly about banks, which is that the impressive catalogue that um, Mark went through, and that um, the kind of openness from Alpha about things that aren't to be done, is it sounds as though you're not ready in some respects if one of these banks fails later, one of these chiefs SIBs fails later today, which which is a pretty good test every morning when you get up and underlines the importance of the office that um, Yelena is is taking up internationally. Um, I think there are a whole set of issues around um, non-bank financial institutions, and I, some of it is at the level of mentality. I haven't read it entirely yet, so I may be mistaken about this, but the um, BIS um, published a whole set of papers yesterday about non-bank financial institutions, open-ended funds, and, um, and financial stability, um, in, including um, an important preface from the, the, the boss of the BIS uh, and scanning it, and I apologize if I'm wrong, but scanning it, I couldn't see any measure mention of resolution. And therefore the mentality of what happens when this one, one of these things fails, hasn't seeped, it still hasn't seeped in. Instead, it was pro-cyclicality and fire sales and stuff, all of which is tremendously important. Um, but actually, the existential thing is it's failed, and what are you going to do? Um, and I mean, the people that have written this document are incredibly talented, dedicated people. So my point is not about them, and this is really addressed to Klaus and, and Yelena. It's about it's about the mindset. It's about it's about in a sense, it's about channeling fear, fear for yourselves. Um, on more concretely on. Um, central counterparties. I mean, here it's 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 much less than um, than than half full. It's it's much more than half empty. It's 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 very close to completely empty. There are these stress tests that say, well, actually, um, CCPs could survive the failure of um, two of the clearing members. Well, most of the clearing members, the big ones, are GSIBs. Um, and so, what the failure? of two clearing members means, if I'm serious about it, is that the resolution plans that we've been discussing for GSIBs have failed. So there are two things going on in those circumstances. JP Morgan and, I don't know, Deutsche Bank have failed, and the best plans, plans I personally believe in, have also failed. Um, there is absolute mayhem in those circumstances. I cannot believe, I don't know, of course, because I'm not an insider, I cannot believe that those stress, CCP stress tests um, take that scenario. I cannot believe it. And if they, if they do, if I'm wrong, I think it's really important um, that the, the methods be published so we can see just how a CCP can survive, even when the world is in absolute, complete meltdown. Um, 
I mean, everybody that's on this um, webinar, not necessarily if it's published afterwards, not necessarily everybody will watching it will know the extent to which this is kind of political blockages and interagency spats in in partly in Washington, partly elsewhere, not the FDIC. Um, and again, a, a challenge, I think, for you, Klaus, as it was for your successors, but a Klaus, and I think Randy tried to deal with this, is the people that turn up for the meetings at Res G and kind of argue the recovery plans will, will be enough. If they're ever wrong, it's not them who will pay the public price. Um, the person who was responsible in the SEC for supervising securities dealers still had their job a while after the failure of all the major US securities dealers, um, even though actually they hadn't bothered to do any prudential supervision of the securities dealers. That's just how life is. And so somehow the idea, uh, the point about CCPs is that they are super systemic. It's incredibly unlikely that they, um, that they will fail. But if ever they do, you will need a plan for where the losses go and the losses, this is what led bail, bail in for banks, the losses either have to go to holders of some deeply subordinated instrument or they will have to go to the taxpayer. And all the, the debates about um, resources um, are full of fudge and full of bullshit and the people involved in them know that. They know that. And that isn't, that's, that's no way to, that's no way to serve the public. They've got enough of their own problems. Very good, thank you. Paul, Jelena, you have heard a number of interesting thoughts and ideas on issues that may deserve actually further work at the level of the group that you are now going to start sharing. Um, so, um, I think it's a good time actually to ask you more directly on your priorities as a new chair of RESG. Uh, how, what are, you know, the, the, the issues you think deserve priority attention of, of the group as we move uh, forward? Mm. Well, absolutely. And, and uh, I, I think it's, um, uh, to Sir Paul's uh, point, there, there, there is unfinished work. Uh, I, I do view the glass as half full, but there is a lot of unfinished work. And I think uh, the, the initial priority of mine is going to ensure that we continue in 2022 by supporting the RESG to deliver on its very comprehensive uh, and ambitious work plan in the coming year. The major components of the proposed 2022 work plan take into account the different stages of maturity of this work across different sectors and the emergence of new challenges on the horizon. And we certainly expect that the next crisis will not look like the prior one. Uh, and I think that's something that regulators quite often air, um, legislators as well. They always address the past crises. And so being flexible and being open minded, understanding the challenges that are going to come with some of the innovation and technological improvements is going to be crucial as we move forward. So I will say for the RESG sector specific working groups for banks in 2022, we will continue to deepen existing engagement uh, to facilitate cross border cooperation. In the, in the resolution of GSIPs and other banks that could be systemic and failure. Uh, th there's a lot of work there, but I think in the interest of time, I just won't go over the individual um, um, points that, that that will require a lot of that is outlined uh, in, in our work and the glass half full, half empty report. For the RESG sector specific working groups for financial market infrastructure, the work, work will continue to focus on CCPs and, and I agree with um, Paul, this is where the glass is half empty, as I mentioned earlier today. Uh, we have a lot of work to do by CCP crisis management groups um, and frankly, more generally, the work to analyze financial resources for CCP resolution. So we'll speak a little bit about that in a, in, and then move on to the insurance work. Uh, we're going to maintain the momentum in deepening engagement among host and home countries uh, in CMGs for CCPs. Um, I think that the path for the CCPs uh, will be very similar to the one followed for many years for the GSIBs and will include conducting the second resolvability assessment process for CCPs, continuing to monitor the completion among CMG member authorities of CCP specific cooperation agreements and other similar CMG specific work, 
And we also need to continue with our work to evaluate the adequacy of financial resources to support CCP in resolution and the treatment of CCP equity in resolution based on FSB's 2020 guidance. Um, a key piece of related work that is underway um, as shown in the work plan is the joint FSB CPMI IOSCO evidence gathering. And if you ever wanted a lot of acronyms, you just got them FSB uh, CPMI IOSCO evidence gathering um, and analysis on, on the use composition, the amount of CCP financial resources in recovery and resolution in default and non default law scenarios. And I would say there is this is going to be absolutely crucial moving forward uh, for CCP resolution. I will say that for the ResG sector specific working group for insurance, uh, we plan to prioritize, prioritize stakeholder engagement in the coming year by um, doing more outreach that draws on forthcoming final papers on funding and resolution and intergroup interconnectedness. We're also going to continue to review the scope of application of resol resolution planning requirements and monitor resolvability more generally. Um, and uh, th there are some subcomponents of that work that are that are pending uh, as well that we're going to focus on. Uh, but I will say this more than anything else. I just think that we need to um, continue the the um, personal engagement of the regulators on, on this panel as well as um, other FSB members, et cetera, and uh, be transparent about our work, be honest about what um, what the open um, areas are, open issues and where the gaps are. Um, the 2021 resolution report set out a work plan that incorporates this approach through numerous workshops and consultations with stakeholders, et cetera, et cetera. And I do think it's really important that we continue that. Um, and I will say, that uh, um, there is also this part of um, um, a resolution preparedness that is going to be driven by digital innovation. And when we look for, to the to the potential challenges that digital innovation may bring to resolution, um, I do not want to front run the process of discussion and engagement that we're going to pursue starting in 2022 among ResG members. Um, but I will say that. Uh, um, it's important to understand how technology can help us and also how it can hinder the process of resolution. Uh, I think there's a lot of benefit that we can we can avail ourselves of with the new developments in technology. Uh, but I also think there are some uh, potential pitfalls and just understanding um, how we're going to deal with those. And do we have the technical expertise at each home and host country? to understand exactly how to deal with technological issues is going to be crucial moving forward. So I think that's a component we also need to focus on uh, and hopefully harness it uh, for the better uh, resolvability of the system and the individual institutions. So with that, in the interest of time, I, I think we're at 8.21 my time, but uh, I will turn it back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Yelena. This looked like an incredibly rich agenda of, of work on this, on this important policy area. Um, so I think I, I should jump now to the questions. Unfortunately, we don't have time. We don't have much time for them. Only a couple of minutes. Maybe let's see if we can take a couple of questions. First question we got is about actually internal TLAC and the role of internal TLAC. Uh, the question says the following is, is good planning and enhanced cooperation between resolution authorities sufficient to result in coordinated SP type resolution without the full downstream preposition of resources? Will mechanisms like internal TLAC always be required? To ensure both resolution authorities feel that the interests of their creditors will be treated fairly in the resolution. We have touched upon briefly on, on internal TLAC, but maybe it would be good to take uh, this opportunity to expand a little bit more on this. So, who would like to take the floor on, on, on that very issue? Uh, Paul and then Elke, I believe. Eh? Thank you. Mm. It's internal TLAC that makes the whole scheme incentive compatible between home and host states. Uh, and so it's tremendously important to, to identify the subgroups that you care about if they fall over. And then if you're in an SPE, this it's different if you're an MPE, um, but if you're an SPE, and remember MPE can be a set of um, distinct SPEs, but if you're an SPE, um, you need to push the losses up to the holding company and then the holding company may be able to absorb them. Um, but if not, then the holding company has to be um, resolved. And the reason this matters 
is because, and this I think is the, the crucial thing about the whole plan, is that four parties have to agree to internal TLAC, the deeply subordinated bonds being issued to the holding company and which can be triggered by the host authorities. It has to be the host authorities for this to work. The home author, apart from the subsidiary board and the main board of the banks, who obviously matter a lot, the home authority need to be content and the, um, the subsidiary the host authority have to be content, which means the host or the home authority has to be content that this isn't a reckless host authority that will trigger the bonds when they don't need to because they're incompetent on the line. And the host authority has to believe that if the holding company needs to be um, resolved, the home authority is capable of doing it. And that particularly matters, for example, concrete cases, Goldman Sachs International, Morgan Stanley International, in my time at least, were not viable on a standalone um, basis, given all the, the kind of business connections between them and the big broker dealer in the, in the US and the Asian outfit um, as well. The key thing is that if those parties can't be satisfied, if they can't agree on the terms of an internal bond, then they have to adopt a different strategy. So they discover they can't trust each other or don't respect each other enough, ex ante, rather than, as Klaus was describing, ex post. And the Fortis case really is instructive. This is the Netherlands and Belgium. My wife is Belgian. Um, her father's Dutch. I mean, these, are, this is, these countries are closer than, I don't know, Mississippi and New York. Um, I mean, closer culturally um, as well as geographically. That, that cooperating, even when you know people really well, isn't easy unless you've got a, a credible ex ante structure. So I saw Simon Ainsworth, I don't know what Simon does these days, ask this question. But you bet, Simon, you were in the room when we talked about all of this in the building I used to go to occasionally, other than the BIS Tower. Internal TLAC is absolutely, um, absolutely vital. And if you're involved in any cases where it isn't there and you think you're doing SPE, it ain't going to work. Okay, Paul, thank you very much. Elke, please uh, turn out. You may want also to address uh, the issue of evaluation. We've got another interesting question in the, in the chat about challenges of conducting valuations and resolution. You may, I mean, you already have some experience on that. You may want to okay. share that with us, but very briefly, please. Then, yeah. right. I think, uh, Paul, you're perfectly right that uh, internal TLEC, or as we call it here in Europe, internal EMRAL, is really needed for in, uh, to make the incentives compatible. But just to believe that you have it is not enough because you still need to have around this an entire safeguarding of how do you really ensure that in case of a crisis, the losses can be also legally sound upstreamed or capital downstreamed. It's basically the same. And for this, I think this is what we are still working on. I have to ensure, at least now with my European head on, you're right, Belgium and the Netherlands are close neighbors, but they have two different legal systems in, in certain areas that we really need to implement. And it's probably at the really at the center of any discussion about home and host with the fear of the host of being abandoned or the belief that if you just sit on your internal TLEC and everyone else sits on his internal TLEC, you've already solved the problem. But I think a single point of entry goes beyond. It goes to our dear thinking that you hopefully keep the subsidiary in going concern because you upstream the losses to the parent and you resolve then the point of entry and not different entities. But I think here we are aligned. It's just uh, the difficult parts of the practical implementation. On valuation, perhaps, I'm not sure what the question really was, but it gives me a chance to say one thing was probably a bit overshooting. We have never, luckily, never had to resolve a GSIP but at least at the SRB, we've proven with the tool set of resolution framework that we can resolve a very sizable, domestically significant bank, which was cross-border active, uh, 
which we did in 2017. Luckily, no other resolution cases since. On valuation, I think the major challenge is really what you need, and there Paul again was right to say it's more an investment banking thinking. You need to have a clear understanding of valuation. You need to potentially have a, a data room to really work from. And in Europe, we have on top the requirement that we need an independent valuation for resolution, which clearly needs to be prepared and probably does not come between Friday lunchtime and Friday night. So resolution in the end is also about good crisis readiness and rather be prepared one time too often than one time too late here. Is it uh, working? Is it something that works? Well, I think there's no alternative to it because as a resolution authority, you have deep uh, and far reaching powers. Bail-in has been invented and you always need afterwards to answer the question, well, has any creditor been worse off in resolution, then he would have been in a potential insolvency. And this is something which probably is then always or will always end in front of courts to be sorted out in the end. But at least we have first re established or have kept financial stability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elke. We are going over a little bit. Let me see whether Mark or Jelena would like to add something before we, we close. Just just a short point on, on the internal tea like because I think it's it's, uh, it's very important. Um, uh, I think both Paul and Elke are correct. Um, the problem is um, if the trust in those discussions uh, is, such, is 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 too deficient. Um, then you pull too much internal tea like uh, into every conceivable uh, corner of a group. Um, you're creating something which is which is um, economically not viable or, or incentivizing either branching, which is very very resolution unfriendly, um, uh, or 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 a move to an MPE strategy. So uh, it's the question about trying to find the right balance and and also acknowledging that that in a complex group there can be some diversification benefit to pooling unallocated TLAC at a higher level in the group because it's not necessarily the case that every subsidiary will fail at the same time and if you maximize the internal TLAC in every group then you're making that assumption that everything is going to fail at the same time uh, so just just to top off that discussion to show how complex things get when you when you address them in reality but uh, Thank you, Bennett. Thanks, uh, uh, Mark. Yelena? Real quick, um, I will say that the key to internal TLAC is for home and host authorities to be able to draw on capabilities for firms to identify and measure resources and to discuss how those resources may be deployed. And I will say home jurisdictions, you know, want to maintain the flexibility to deploy resources as and when needed, and host jurisdictions want certainty of the resources in their jurisdiction. And the key here, as Mark pointed out, will be to have a meaningful engagement around this balancing act and deployment as and when needed. And this is a capability to maintain over time and certainly we'll continue focusing on that as we move forward. Thank you. Okay, many thanks, Elena. Many thanks all the speakers for this uh, incredibly rich uh, panel discussion. We have covered much ground on the question half full, half empty. I think most of you are on the optimistic side. It's obvious that uh, is still uh, much work is needed in order to fully fill the the class or the or the battle or the jar. So uh, you are going to have a visa agenda in front of you uh, clearly, uh, Jelena. So we wish you all the best. Good luck on this very important and challenging endeavor. So thanks a lot. With that, let me get back to. Uh, to uh, Eva for closer remarks. Well, thanks, Fernando. And I would simply add my thanks again to Klaus, uh, Elke, Jelena, uh, Mark and Paul for taking the time to be here virtually. And uh, well, as you have heard, uh, we published the resolution report just hours ago, and it raises the question glass half full or still half empty. And I think there is a consensus that, as Fernando mentioned, uh, it's important to keep filling the glass uh, so as to make the next decade a success. This concludes our high level event.
Thank you to those in the audience who have been present from the start and for those of you who missed some of the discussion or those who enjoyed it so much that they want to listen to it again. It has been included and it will be posted on the FSB and FSI websites in the coming days. So let me also, on behalf of uh, Fernando, thank everybody, in particular the colleagues here at the FSI and FSB who made this event possible. And uh, goodbye.